degrees of freedom. That's what this video is about, y'all. But by the way, I'm not gonna tell you the answer until the end. Why? Because I want you to stay here and the actual answer is kind of complicated. Instead, I'm gonna answer this question. What do degrees of freedom tell us about our statistical models? And to do that, I'm gonna use a metaphor. By the way, I got this metaphor from Joseph Rogers, collaborator and mentor. And what Joe said is building statistical models is a lot like accounting. So in the real world, we buy commodities, but in statistics, we buy parameters. We might estimate a mean or estimate a slope, or we might estimate a correlation. And to estimate those things, we have to buy them. What do we buy it with? Data! So each observation in our data set allows us to buy parameters we can estimate. Now remember, this is a metaphor. We're not actually buying parameters. But it's important when we build our statistical models that after we buy parameters, we still have money left over. Because the money we don't use to buy the parameters are left over to test our model. Let me say that again, because that's kind of important. We buy parameters. And then that which we don't buy, we use to test our model. So if we have no money left over, we have no data left over, there's nothing to test our model with. So let's look at an example. Let's say we have two data points. From these two data points, we can estimate a regression line. And to estimate a regression line, we need an intercept and a slope. Oh wow, that fits perfectly. But we have a problem. We just spent all of our degrees of freedom. Yes, that model fits perfectly, but that's not all that impressive. Our model fits perfectly because it has to. It has no other choice. If there are two data points and you're estimating two parameters, your model has to fit perfectly. So there's nothing impressive about that. Let me give you a metaphor within a metaphor. It's kind of like inception for metaphors. So when I was a graduate student, I was having a conversation with my mom. And at the time I was working both as a professional photographer and as a statistician at my university. And I thought that was kind of a unique combination to be a professional statistician and a professional photographer. That's kind of cool. And so I did some research and calculated some numbers and figured out what is the probability that someone is both a statistician and a photographer. And that probability ended up being like 0.0000001 or like one in 10 million or something like that. And so I was talking to my mom and I said, that's pretty cool. I am one in 10 million. Well, I don't amount to a hill of beans. And my mom was super impressed. And she said, yeah, just add to that the fact that you're, you're a husband and a father and you're really good at drawing things. I said, yeah, mom, that's great. Except anybody could be one in 10 million. If you add any sort of combination of anybody's abilities, everybody ends up being unique. But what was impressive about mine was I was unique with only two. And that's just how it is with our statistical models. It is not impressive if we can fit our model with lots and lots of estimated parameters. If you've got 30 observations and 20 parameters, guess what? Your model's gonna fit and it's gonna fit really good. But because it has to fit, not because there is anything inherently good about your model. So what is our take home point? If our model happens to fit despite having lots and lots of degrees of freedom left over, that's pretty impressive. And that's what we're aiming for. So degrees of freedom tells us that information. It tells us how many parameters we've estimated, which Joe Rogers called our spent degrees of freedom. And it tells us how many data points are left to test our model, which we might call our remaining degrees of freedom. So now back to the question that you probably came here for in the first place. What are degrees of freedom? For that, let me give you another metaphor. Let's say at your job, you had to work exactly 40 hours a week. Or another way of putting it, you averaged eight hours a day over a five day week but maybe your boss doesn't really care when you work those hours. You could do eight hours for five days, or 10 hours for four days, or 13 and a third hours on three days. In other words, there are seven days a week, so you have seven degrees of freedom where you have the ability to choose when you wanna work. But let's say that this week you had a rough week, so Monday through Saturday, you only work five hours a day, or 30 hours total. Now it's Sunday, it is your deadline. You have to average 40 hours a week. In other words, you have spent six of your degrees of freedom. You have no degrees of freedom remaining. Why? Because your total must add up to 40. So because you work 30 hours, you have to today on Sunday work 10 hours. So because you must work 40 hours for the first six days, you are free to do whatever the heck you want. But on that last day, you have to work a specific number of hours. Likewise, let's say we have a data set with seven numbers. Let's say the mean of this data set equals five. And let's also say that you know the first six numbers, but you don't know the last number. And maybe the first six numbers are all fives. What is the last number? It has to be five. It has no freedom to be anything else. Likewise, in our statistical models, when we estimate parameters, we constrain what the parameters have to be. So that's what the idea of degrees of freedom means. What's the point? Degrees of freedom tell us how many parameters we've estimated via the spent degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom also tell us how many of our data points are allowed to vary. We call these free 
And when they are free to vary, we can then test how impressive our model is. So again, in this model, there are no degrees of freedom left. So we can't possibly test how well this model works. On the other hand, in this model, we have lots of degrees of freedom left, which gives us ample opportunity to see if our model actually fits. And in this case, it fits pretty good. But here is an example where we have lots of degrees of freedom, and we can test our model and find out that our model really sucks. And let me say one final comment. Again, this is one of the points Joe Rogers made in his paper, which is linked in the description, by the way. And he said the way that we report degrees of freedom is very frustrating, and it would drive any accountant crazy. So here is an example of an ANOVA summary table. By the way, in this degrees of freedom column, there is no mention of which of these parameters are spent degrees of freedom versus remaining degrees of freedom. But for your information, these represent spent, and this represents remaining. So we should probably reformulate the ANOVA summary table to recognize that there are spent and there are remaining degrees of freedom. Which, oh, by the way, the visual modeling module in JASP, oh yeah, it has two columns, spent and remaining, bam. So that is what degrees of freedom are all about. If you have any questions, be sure to leave them in the comments below. Remember to like, subscribe, share, and turn on some music and have a dance party. This quarantine's getting old. All right, peace out. Like, subscribe, and comment. My dad's YouTube money pays for my meals. Yeah,